Welcome back to Common Ground and Inside Look at Suffolk County. I'm your host, Steve Tompkins, Chief of External Affairs for the Suffolk County Sheriff's Department. Now, as I mentioned to you before break, we're sitting here with John Walsh, uh, the chairman of the Democratic, uh, Massachusetts Democratic Party, and we're talking about all manner of things. Now, on the first half of the show, we got all of the that good stuff that we need to know about the party and what the party does and how the party works with folks, civically minded folks and others, to move uh, the state forward. Now we're going to talk about the, the nitty gritty, the fun stuff, what happens when you actually get into the heat of a campaign. And as I mentioned to you, one of John's favorite either pastimes or things to talk about or both <laughs> is door knocking. And you know, some people you say door knocking and you can hear the hair on the back of their neck <laughs> curl up. So John, l let me ask you about that. What What is it? Uh, and, and we worked with Mike Firestone on Elizabeth's what campaign, um, who did a one heck of a job. Historic. But you know, they would say like you know either a couple of times a week or during, at the end of the week, how many doors they knocked on. Right. What's the importance of that? So the door knocking is the uh, is the uh, biggest volume activity that you see in a good grassroots campaign. But what it really is is face to face conversations. So if you think about it in the broadest terms. It's, a, it's an up from the ground communication as opposed from, to broadcast. So you have a message, it's a TV ad, it's a newspaper ad, a radio ad, it's a Facebook post, it's whatever is designed to say something and have it available broadly. Um, it wasn't that long ago, 1960, I sort of remember it. And I was a kid, but still there, Jack Kennedy, this was new. Right? It was like, wow, this could be it. And so that whole, but what happened was is it, it, the pendulum swung too far. And a politics that had always been about relationships and people talking to people, mm -hmm. and I think the Democratic Party is as much to blame at this as any, and, and I don't even want to put it all in past tense, still today, we overemphasize that. So the skill you need to win for office is the ability to raise money, number one, mm. which is clearly not true. I mean, by any, by, yeah. however you want to measure what you want your elected officials to be, maybe that's not a bad thing to have, but it's certainly not the most important, but it can be, it can preclude good people. But the truth of the matter is, is people don't like that, number one. They like face-to-face, -face, person to person. There's a second piece to it, which I don't want to go to seem like I'm too philosophical, but we have the greatest system of government in the world, I believe, this democracy. And the reason that it works is because the government only gets power based on the consent of the governed. That's the principle that's written in all the documents. That's the basis of all of this. What we need to do is to drive the consent of the government beyond just the acquiescence, like, okay, never mind, to an active, informed, engaged consent right. that they participate. And so one, one of the pieces, when I knock on a door and this past year, and uh, someone on the other end says, I'm, I'm with Scott Brown, it was remarkable how many times they said, but thanks for doing this. Because what I try to tell door knockers when they're going out is when you stand at that door, and the person opens from the other side, right. you there are exactly the opposite of what they hate about politics. They hate the lies, they hate the screaming, the nasty ads, the back and forth. Right. And as a contrast, here you are, a normal person, humbly asking for their consideration for your candidate or your idea, willing to have a conversation about the good points and the bad points, right, right. and walking away, and people, there, there's all kinds of evidence that shows when people engage with a campaign with a real live person face to face, not only do they like it better, but they actually tell people about it. Mm. <laughs> As opposed to even like, we still do a lot of phone calling, right. um, but you know, fewer and fewer people have a phone. Fewer and fewer of the ones that do will answer it if they don't know the caller ID. Right, 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 so, right. but even when you connect with someone, the campaign gets a benefit. Like I call you, you tell me I'm with you, I'm against you, I'm undecided. That's good information. You might even tell me why, you're, how, what criteria you're going to use. That helps me to try to convince you if you have made up your mind. If you're with us, it tells me don't f let Steve forget to vote. If you're not with us, it says okay, we got to move on. We got to talk to somebody else. But, we, but what happens is I don't impact you when I call you on the phone. There have been studies that show someone gets a marketing call, a political call, right. five minutes later someone says, who was that that called? Right. And one of the biggest responses is, what call? 
because the interruption that phone call is into someone's life is so incidental. It has no impact beyond the conversation. When you stand at the doorstep, you, you not only do you get the same information, you're with us, you're against us, but then the person on the other side of the door, I had so many experiences. I had one in, up in the North Shore was knocking on doors for Elizabeth and, and John Tierney, and at 8 o'clock on a Saturday morning, this guy, 30 years old, but as, and you know, he was undecided. I made my pitch and like, okay, I left him some literature. As I'm walking down the path, I hear him say to his wife, wow, these Elizabeth Warren and John Tierney people are serious about their grassroots. Like, well, that's, of course, for me, that's heaven. I could knock on <laughs> doors for years. just from that. Right. But the real truth right, is this right, guy right. was telling someone before I got off his, his porch. Right, right. And that's the truth. People will communicate. Well, it's so important. Well, okay, but so maybe in a, in a different sort of capacity, all of the television ads that you see about candidates and campaigns, although some of them are of what I would call uh, aggressively negative nature, but they're out there, don't they serve the same purpose? Well, they serve a purpose. I, th I think that we overspend on them, we overemphasize them, we overanalyze their impact. Uh, you know, and, and I guess if you had a situation where one candidate was running ads and another wasn't, that would have an impact. I think m many times today, and maybe even to a degree in the Senate race, the ads were defensive. They were, you know, and then you add on in today's political world, some of the ads are terrible. I mean, they are professionally terrible. Yeah. And then they're negative and nasty, and there is no evidence that people like them. The guys who sell ads will tell you all kinds of anecdotes about this negative ad that drove somebody's negatives higher, blah, blah, blah. Okay, I'm, I mean, I'd be willing to dig into those numbers a little bit more, and maybe there's something to that. But what we're really doing, which is also combining with our current or hopefully old tactics of targeting likely voters, you know, the, in the, the, the science of campaigns has increasingly become Joe votes, Mary doesn't. We're going to talk to Joe. Mary doesn't vote, don't worry about her. This person sometimes votes, we've got to talk to Joe. Maybe we'll get to this person if we need to in the end. Mm -hmm. It really is a story about how the Democratic Party has engaged communities of color. In, in a shameful reality, we come, if it's close, late, with the bluntest GOTV tactics. If we organized in Wellesley for 20 years the way we've organized in Roxbury, Wellesley wouldn't vote either. And by the way, what's been happening here is in communities of color across Massachusetts, our candidates and our, and our operation has been aggressive. So we're just getting the who voted stats back now. I could tell you preliminary, spent some time with it yesterday, Communities of color in Massachusetts is evidenced by about 150 precincts that are principally communities of color. Mm -hmm. um, turnout up 6% from 2008. And what's happening is, even in this old world of targeted who's good and who's bad voters and we're going to spend our money on the good guys, what's happening is we are growing good voters in these communities. Not by some, well, oh, sure, everybody liked Barack Obama because he was black. That's silly. What really happened is Steve Tompkins and, and, and Jason Burrell and Maverick Afonso were working these communities, engaging face-to-face -face and spreading, running a real campaign for a long period of time the same way. And so it's so, so important because, so let me just be... Go for it. We're good, right? right. I mean, if communities of color, they vote for Democrats because we stand for this. So this is, the, not only is it the right thing to do, which right. I want to make that case too, right. but this is now more than that. This is a strategy to win. As there are probably dozens and dozens of politicians in Massachusetts today who are gathering around tables like this with their closest advisors thinking, well, there might be an open Senate seat. The governor's not running for re-election, and that means this office and this office and this office, and maybe there's a space for me to move up. For those folks who are sitting around those tables, if they're all chubby Irish guys like me, they better go find somebody who understands what happened in communities of color in this election, because it's not just the numbers, which is great, and nobody thought the numbers, you know, oh, 2008 was special because the enthusiasm was all going to go away. That's not it. It's an organized delivery. And, and I think there's three things that really drove that. Number one was the Warren campaign, which you were so instrumental in, and the people that were hired and the focus and the actual work that those organizers did in those communities. Number two 
was a, a remarkably engaged leadership amongst the elected leaders within those communities. So 10 years ago, I was the coordinated campaign manager. Andrew Cabral was not the sheriff. Sonia mm -hmm. Chang Diaz was not the senator. Mm -hmm. You go through the city councils, Tito, Felix, Diana, mm -hmm. You know, Carlos Enriquez, who over, over, exactly. No, this is different, right? right? And not only at the elected level, but then at the campaign level where these new, engaged, in many cases young, enthusiastic people from the community who know how to do this. And then the third leg of this stool was a really helpful effort by a number of groups, including SEIU and Chinese Progressive Association, mm -hmm. a number of groups that have for years been building capacity uh, to do it. And so our challenge, as I know you and I have talked about, is to make that sustainable. It's, it's, so first of all, it's a, good, it's a good thing to do. So I've been talking about how this is really a good strategy to win. But you think about it. If we have a political strategy that focuses on the super voters, you are creating a smaller and smaller and smaller group. If you don't get out and register new voters, if you don't engage people who are busy, and we, we, our politics is going to be like it is in Washington now, where there's like, like you take 10 random people on the streets in America could figure out the deal to avoid the fiscal cliff in two hours, and that would include they'd hang in for a little to get pizza, so they could, it would take long. Right. But our leaders, because we've got this really wretched, focused, brand of politics that's not broad and inclusive has not only put us in a spot where we can, so one of the stats, two months out, maybe six weeks out of the thing, I think one of the polling organizations did a poll that said if everyone who was eligible to vote mm -hmm. voted, Barack Obama would win in a landslide. Mm -hmm. So there's, is that the problem or the opportunity? And that's really what we have to start working on. And we are, and I think that we're going to have some opportunities to go get it soon. <laughs> well, not, yeah, not, not bringing it to the next point. So now, um, the word has it that the president may tap Senator Kerry, move on. That will open up uh, a, a special election. Two-part question. One, um, what does that mean for the Democratic Party insofar as engagement and finances? Do you guys fund that? Does that come from the feds? How is that a special election paid for? And then two, who jumps in? You know, and, 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 and I know you may not be able to, you know, get, get knee deep and get into the weeds on that, but who are the likely uh, folks that would look at moving up that to that next mm -hmm. step on the ladder to be a public servant? So let's first deal with how does the party deal with mounting the special election? 